To their horror, there on the wall of the basement was a message written in what looked like blood. I'm in your room. Come and find me. What? Daniel LaPlante was born on May the 16th, 1970 in Middlesex County, Massachusetts. He had a very challenging upbringing from the start. The family home was overrun with stray animals and the garden looked like a junkyard. Locals would generally avoid the family. Red flags. And while growing up in Townsend, Daniel was sexually and psychologically abused by many of the male adults in his life, uh, including his biological father, his stepfather, and many adult males that were friends of his stepfather. Fucking hell. Yeah. So he didn't get off to a best start. It's, that's something that is again not comparing two things or whatever but when it's like some like a f- people's people have fucked up parents yeah but when they then get their fucking friends involved as well mm. it's like how there's... does a person meet another person yeah and go basically I've got a son that I do this to and I was just wondering if you you, you I was joking anyway yeah. <laughs> like, what, yeah. what, how how do you end up in the same circle as someone else like that yeah it's like Fred and Rose West how do you oh. fi- how, how did Fred bring that up mm. do you know what I mean on what date do you go oh, I know like killing third, and shit. yeah third date sleep with her fifth date <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, you know the murders <laughs> Thank fuck I found you. What do you think of this patio? <laughs> Love Harmony's really paid off. <laughs> Love Harmony. <laughs> oh, anyway. So when Daniel went to high school, his lack of hygiene as well as some strange behavioural tendencies led him to being referred to a psychiatrist. He was then diagnosed with hyperactivity, which is later uh, renamed as ADHD. Instead of treating Daniel, the psychiatrist began sexually abusing Daniel. Oh, what? Like, how was that possible? As well, the, the lack of hygiene thing, that's actually, you know, sometimes it's a defense mechanism. You know, if you, if you kind of are really making yourself, you know, smell or being unpleasant, it's a way to try and hopefully repel people. Right. And uh, yeah, it's a bit of a sad thing to bring up, but I think the kids at school that don't have great hygiene, they often get picked on quite a lot. Mm. Like, And I think even as a kid, that would probably be something that I'd turn my nose up at a bit and like go... Look at look at them. Well, kids are so, bastards, yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe that's something that needs to be done going forward. There, there could be deeper rooted issues, and they're just what are the odds that they just don't like a shower? Like there might be some yeah, up, yeah, more, yeah. more stuff there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you're absolutely right. As a result of his poor hygiene, he was bullied relentlessly. So he's got he's being sexually abused at home, sexually abused and bullied at school. Uh, he basically had nowhere safe uh, to hang his hat. At the age of 16, Daniel turned to a life of crime. He started breaking into people's homes, sometimes to steal their possessions, but in other cases, he would do it to simply move a few items of furniture. What? So he wanted to make the homeowners feel unsettled. He wanted to disturb them. He wanted them to be aware that someone had been in, but not taken anything. Like a human poltergeist. That's quite sinister, that, isn't it? Even though it's not actually hurting anyone, it is that, that would fuck you up if you, if you saw that. If you kept going home and your mayo was where your ketchup was every time, you'd be like, am yeah. I losing the plot? <laughs> yeah, just made lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it is also alleged during this time he occasionally broke into houses while its occupants were still at home simply to watch them while they slept. That's the creepy... I, I used to always have a thing about that. Being yeah. watched whilst you're asleep. Yeah, because we're, we're the ground floor flat and we didn't have curtains when we first moved in. I said to Caitlin, we're not moving in if there's no curtains, babe. Because I didn't want to <laughs> be sleeping in a room where there's no curtains and people just were looking... Yeah, like, that, no, that's, that's oh, a given. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, that's, that's a what, shame. She, what, she was keen for that? She, oh, she was keen for it. It's not like she's good getting <laughs> off to it. But no, we, we basically, I was like, first thing I'm doing when we're getting in here, well, have some food, obviously, feel comfortable. Yeah. And then put the bloody thing up and then we put it up wonky, so that's been a Pain in the ass the whole time we've been there, but I moved into my place about six months ago now, and I yeah, still haven't di- heard and diary of CEO, <laughs> <laughs> and I still haven't, <laughs> and I still haven't even got curtains. What? Yeah, nothing a- anywhere. Yeah. Why haven't you got? Jack curtains? can't do anything himself. I yeah, know. But... I've just realised we had like a little bit of a house party at yours recently, mm. and I didn't even realise you didn't have curtains, and we were playing darts in one room, so someone could have just been watching us play darts in your darts room. Uh, this is what I told you. The delivery driver saw me playing darts, came in and had a go. I just a, wanted to make another point. Room. Yeah, that's what I was trying <laughs> yeah, to make a point. Say, Jack has a, Jack's Jack's minted. He's got a darts room. I've just I've not I'm not doing anything with it at the moment because we we we've got a lot of but mould, Ben. So the carpet's right. been pulled. A lot of mould. Yeah, so they, they've come around. They've ripped the whole carpet. I've thought, what else can I do in this room mm. for a few hours? <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> what I was going to do with it for everywhere. So, so you, everywhere you can just look in. There's not even everywhere. Yeah, the only place they can't look in Frosty is my, my bedroom. Mm. Yeah, but you but... sleep on like the fifth floor. Fuck! <laughs> what? <do you> want <laughs> you have to get, get past the moat first. <laughs> <laughs> Ral, Ral moat. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> He's got yeah. a rappel up the side of the house. But what I've done now is I've got a green screen that I hang um, a bed sheet over and then just pull out. You just key your bed out. <laughs> just, just buy a fucking curtain. <laughs> green screen curtains in. <laughs> so long winded. Such a nerdy film. Trick. On word. <laughs> He's involved. <laughs> right, sorry, um, back to back to the case. Yeah. <laughs> back to the sinister boy in the wall. So it's believed during one of these particular break-ins, he saw a photo of a young girl that captivated him, and this was a photo of young Annie Andrews. So basically, what he would then do is reach out to Annie. Uh, he got her number of number of the house, phoned phoned her up, introduces himself, and told him he got her number from a mutual friend. What year is this? Sorry, this is around kind of the uh, mid nineteen eighties. Oh, so not like. Not way back when, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking hell. So Daniel told Annie that he went by the name Danny and that he was actually the captain of the football team at a nearby high school. Annie and Danny. On the phone, he described himself as tall, blonde, athletic and smart, when in actual fact he was small, brunette, slightly chubby and quite greasy looking. That's me as a kid. (laughs) (laughs) Me now. I like when he said tall, blonde, athletic. I shrugged like, well, some of us have got to be. And then he said the next description. <laughs> he literally just described the happy hour co host. <laughs> she thought I was rocking up. Stevie turned up. Oh, both bad, really. <laughs> so if we're being serious, they want we are Robbie. both ugly. So I don't know how I can get away with that. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Maybe he kept on the foosball team. <laughs> <laughs> I played foosball. <laughs> No, I didn't. I played futsal. Oh, it's the same oh. shit. No, foosball's the table thing. Oh, I thought foosball was German for football. What's, what's football. your thing? Futsal. It's <laughs> even worse. What's that? Indoor. Oh, that's right. You yeah. are it, hiding in walls. <laughs> you'd, you'd play with a size four ball and it was like slightly more weighted. Well, that's more. I, I, I associate that with more like ticky tacky skill. Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. That's better than yeah, thank you. tables. Back to boy in the wall. So the two continued to speak regularly on the phone, and although Annie had some initial doubts about him, she eventually would agree to go on a date with Daniel. He would pick her up at her house, and they would go to the local fair. When he arrived to collect her, Annie was disappointed to see what he actually looked like. Sorry. Fact, this is before Catfish, but this is... <laughs> Neve was there going, are you okay? <laughs> Look, Annie, oh. the, the original Catfish. Yeah. It would have been easier to do that back then as well, because they couldn't yeah. just say FaceTime me and prove it. Well, that's True. it, yeah. Mm. She'd agreed to the date, and he was there, so... Mm. They went on the date. Right. Anyway, Annie goes on the date with him. The pair go out to get ice cream. Daniel behaves very strangely during the date and becomes unusually fascinated when he learns that her mother had recently passed away after a long battle with cancer. Annie found the whole thing uncomfortable and asked Daniel to take her home, so he does. A few months later, Annie and her sister Jessica, who are both still mourning the loss of their mother, decide to conduct a seance to reach out to their mother uh, in the afterlife. Strangely, the girls start to hear noises in the house. Oh. They told their dad, who dismissed the noises, as they were basically two young girls going through the loss of their mother, and uh-huh. then, you know, they're just, it's not actually happening. The tapping started to become pretty constant and only tended to occur when the girls were home alone or in the dead of night while their father was asleep. It was becoming disruptive to the point that the girls couldn't sleep anymore. One evening, when the girls were coming home, the tapping began again. Again, again, began again, but this time it sounded as though it was coming through the floor below them. Annie grabbed a kitchen knife, and together with her sister, the two crept down to the basement. That's pretty brave, that. Yeah, for, for two yeah. young girls to get a knife and go down to the basement. I was going to shout out Annie for the fact that he turned up looking the way he did after a second and go down the whole date with him. Yeah. And why didn't? Why did he then be be creepy? It's like, y- yeah, what a chance. Yeah, yeah. What a chance. Y- you've defied all odds just getting mm. to the fair. Yeah. And then... <laughs> so the girls go down to the basement armed with a kitchen knife. To their horror, there on the wall of the basement was a message written in what looked like blood. I'm in your room. Come and find me. What? Other messages in the basement included, I'm back, find me if you can, and marry me. That is not how you go about it. Yeah. (coughs) On lunch break, back at what? (laughs) (laughs) Stunned, Annie and Jessica turned and fled up the basement stairs into the house. They ran to a neighbor's home who let them know that they would call their father to return from work. Their father returns home, and as he walks into Annie's bedroom, he finds a small man wearing a wig, caked in makeup, dressed in one of his his late wife's dresses, wielding a small axe. It was Daniel. Oh my God. Brian, instead of facing the boy, runs out of the house and calls, poli- and calls the police from a neighbor's house. The police arrive, check the property, but nobody is found. 
Police do, however, notice a hidden access to a crawl space under the stairs. And as the police look inside, they found Daniel Laplante hiding, as well as food debris, clothing and wrappers. And it was later determined that Daniel had been living within the crawl space in the void between the walls of the Andrews family home for around two months. Oh my fucking God. The story doesn't end there, unfortunately. Oh, it doesn't end there? No. No. That was scary enough. Yeah, so... He basically gets put into a juvenile facility. He's still a teenager at the time. His mother bails him out. Uh, he's only in there for three or four months in total. After he's bailed out, he immediately goes to back, back to old habits and starts breaking into houses, rearranging furniture, knocking on walls. This time, though, when he breaks into a house, he notices two handguns. So he steals them. And on the afternoon of December 1st, 1987, Daniel, armed with one of the stolen handguns, walked half a mile from his family home through a wooded area to the home of the Gustafsson family. It's here while the father of the home, Andrew Gustafsson, was away at work, Daniel brutally raped and murdered the mother, Pristilla Gustafsson, before drowning their two small infant children in the bar. Oh my word. The father then comes home to find him. Fucking yeah. hell. A massive manhunt is launched, and a few days later, Daniel is eventually found hiding in a dumpster. He's convicted of three murders and sentenced to serve three separate 15-year sentences. He's still in prison today. He's appealed all of the sentences. However, he's likely to be eligible for parole in 2032. In 10 years. Mm. Fucking hell. Yeah. That's crazy. Do you, do you think... Do you think... Do you think that, that was planned? Or do you think he had a psychotic episode? Or Which part of the... What, the... Just the end bit. Because it does seem like... Like, obviously, it's all fucking creepy, but there's one thing hiding in the walls, and then one thing doing all that, ex that mm -hmm. extreme stuff at the end. Like, was he turning up to hide in the walls and then had a bit of a weird... The thing is, like, well, he obviously has a fascination with mums because, you know, he got, he got fascinated as soon as he heard the story about how the girl's mum's passed away from cancer. Yeah. And then, you know, he's gone on to the other mother. I mean, he, so there must be some... He's got some kind of issues with his own mother, obviously being with partners who, who abused him. Mm. Um but it is, it's, I mean, it's one that I'd like to hear what Dr. Das would have to say about it, really, because it's oh, kind definitely. of the behavior of going into breaking into someone's house and, you know, and just moving things about is creepy. But it, as it goes, you know, it's not as bad as stealing stuff and mm. it's not as bad as you, it, it's uh, more kind of just get the thrill of doing it rather than any gain from doing it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he just likes the control, mm. having the control of other people's mm. emotions. And what yeah. I wonder now is he was how uh, how old when he did this, roughly? Uh, like, well, 17. 17, yeah. And now, so he must be, what, 50s now? Early? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. In his 50s. I always wonder when these psychopaths do shit like this at a young age, he's obviously not, hope well, he's not killed anyone else unless he's killed someone in prison. But now, is he, like... What is he saying to people in prison now? Is he going, I was fucking mental back then? Or is he going, or is he just going like... Is he like, still in that same mindset? Yeah, yeah. Has he been rehabilitated, essentially? I, I don't think he was a psychopath, though, because it's obviously... It's, it, it, is he after this very fine line? Not everyone that kills is a psychopath, obviously. And it, it is a very. We're going to do a quiz with you later on to see if you guys are psychopaths. Oh and right. Okay. The, the, the thing with the thing with psychopaths as well is you can be a, a fully functioning psychopath and, and have you know be live in society. It doesn't mean you're going to go do horrible things. Um, I went to a really interesting talk before um, where basically they were saying one of the things is you, you're very calm under stress, and they were showing pictures to loads of different people like you know rabbits and flowers and whatnot, and then a horrible like scene from the war, like someone's like leg blown off. To some people watching it, you know, for me or you, your heart rate will go faster because you're panicky. But for a psychopath, they would even be calmed down by the horrible images because they look at it kind of more like a jigsaw, more a puzzle. So like high-level surgeons can be psychopaths because they're not panicking when they're doing brain surgery. They're trying to fix this puzzle. They're very calm. And it's like people, you know, in high-end business who can fire thousands of people not, and, not, and not feel any kind of empathy because they're kind of like they're doing this to make money. My job is to make money. I'm going to fire those people and I can sleep, you know, sleep at night. It's people can be high-functioning psychopaths and also yeah, hold down normal jobs and, and a lot of high-pressure jobs. That's fascinating, that. What, you got, you got 17? You, you, you were one away from psychopathy, likely. Really? Yeah.